Hello, and welcome back. Uh, I'm going to show an example now of using the ideas we just defined in the conditional density video on an example problem. Uh, if you haven't seen the video, if you came across this one first, I would recommend uh, you look for the, the video on conditional densities, uh, which also includes how we define uh, probabilities of events conditioned on continuous random variables. Uh, whoop, wrong way. Uh, go to the next page here. So this is the, the problem. This is, is a classic problem uh, I've, I've borrowed out of uh, Charlie Ferry and, and Tamala's book on probability and random processes for electrical engineers. Uh, that is having a spinner that, uh, like a, a little dial with, with two arrows on it that are attached at the middle, and, and they can uh, spin around and around. So it, it's like you uh, like a kid's game where you flick them with your finger, and they're going to go around and around. Each of them are going to stop somewhere on this dial between 0 and 1 independently of each other. So the, the two spinners are, are decoupled enough that they just spin around or maybe you flick them both quickly in succession you don't know where they're going to end up. So R is the continuous random variable that's the location of the red arrow. B is the, the location of the blue arrow. Again, they both go between 0 and not quite 1. It's an open interval. That, that de that's not really an important detail in this problem. And we're going to look at the event a is the event that the, the red spinner is greater than blue. So I guess the example I drew here is the opposite. This is an example or an outcome that would be in this space A complement. Right, R in this picture is less than B because R would look like it's about an eighth and B is just under a half. So B is actually bigger. And I'm going to show an example of how we can find uh, the conditional de density of R given that A happened and also how we find the probability of A uh, given the value of little r, how it is a function of little r. Okay, so let's uh, let's start that first. So again, the the first thing we're going to do here is that we're going to find the or sort of first part of the example is find the conditional density. That is, what's the density of little r, or the density of the random variable r, given that r is bigger than b. And again, our approach for this, like like I mentioned in the the uh, tutorial video, is generally uh, well, two things. One is we're going to use the CDF. The other is a lot of these problems, it's very helpful to start off by uh, by drawing a square to represent these things geometrically. We can do that well whenever we have uh, random variables that are uniform and independent, because if we have, if we have two things that are uniform and independent, then the... that's not a very good R. If they're uniform and independent, we can represent the probability of an event by this area. So I've got this square. So this square represents all the possible outcomes as the red and sp blue spinners go from 0 to 1. And if, so if we're looking at this, the event that, that you know, we said A is the event, just to remind you that R is greater than or equal to B. Well, geometrically in this space, that event, A, is this region up here above The line, right? So this this in here is the event A. So again, to find it, our approach, our strategy is going to start with step one is to find the CDF. So that will be the CDF, F of R given A, the distribution function. And then step two is take a derivative. Okay, so if we're going to do that, the first step, f of r given a, is just start directly from the definition. So that's the probability of the intersection of two events, that, that r is less than or equal to the little r, and at the same time, that I'm in A, which is, is that R is bigger than B, all divided by the probability of A. Right? That's directly out of the definition of a conditional probability. And so let me let me rewrite this substituting the real event for A. So this is R is less than little r. So this is going to be a function. I should should have pointed that out earlier. This is going to be a function of little r, this because it's a distribution. But we're saying I'm looking for the intersection of these two events, the probability of that intersection, divided by, oops, oh, divided 
divided by the probability that r is greater than or equal to b. Well, just scrolling back here, by symmetry, it's very clear that the denominator is a half. Right? The probability that r is greater than b is a half. So I can quickly set that in there. All right, so let's uh, let's let's fill that in. Uh, having a little trouble draw driving the whiteboard today. So this is the denominator is a half, and then we say, well, what's the probability of this? How do we represent that geometrically? We say, well, I want to just sort of look at this. Imagine I have some event. So this is my value, little r. So I'm looking at this outcome. I'm saying, well, the region, let me, uh, maybe I'll color this green, or bound it by green. This triangle here are the set of outcomes in the intersection of the two events, right? That R is bigger than B, and that the capital R is less than little r. So the area of this triangle gives me that probability. Well, this triangle is, is little r on each side, right? I've got R here and R here. So the area of this triangle is 1 half R squared. So that's the probability of the intersection of those two events, that, that the random variable r is less than or equal to the argument little r, and at the same time that r is greater than or equal to b. And so that sort of makes sense. As, as, as this increases, as r is increasing, as I move up here in r, there's more and more area. So there's a better and better chance for larger values of r that I'm bigger than b and still less than that little r. So let's go update our equation down below with that. Right, so if we fill that in, here I have 1 half r squared. So these two cancel out, and I'm left with just r squared. Okay, so that's a pretty, uh, or that, you know, that, and, and I guess I, I should, to be to be precise, should point out this is true. Oops. We can make this a little more precise by saying this is, you know what, I'm just going to start on a new page. So so if we sort of re summarize our results, the conditional CDF is actually going to be equal to, to be precise, it's going to be r squared between 0 and 1. Uh, it's going to be 0 for r less than 0, right, because we're below that square there. And the, and the conditional PDF is, conditional CDF, the conditional distribution, will be 1 above 1. And again, this is reassuring if I think about maybe sketching this. It would look something like this. So it would ramp up from 0 to 1. But I know a CDF should never get bigger than 1, and this doesn't. And so this would be my CDF. Just to make it clear, this is the asymptote here. And this is the sketch of the, of the conditional distribution. So now, uh, step 2, I'm going to say now I want the conditional PDF. I'm going to take the derivative with respect to the outcome, which is little r in this case, of the conditional distribution. So just as normal densities are derivatives of normal distributions, conditional densities are derivatives of conditional distributions. And we can just very quickly get that from what we had above here a second ago. Right? And we can say this is going to be equal to, if I write them in order, I guess 0 for r less than or equal to 0, 2r, because the derivative of r squared is 2r between 0 and 1, and then it will be 0 again, because the derivative of 1 is equal to 0 for r bigger than 1. So I could uh, maybe scoot over a little bit here and say that, so if I sketch that, 
my conditional density function is basically a ramp. Well, that's not a good example of the ramp because one of the features of that ramp right is the slope is 2. So I should really have a, a, a steeper slope than that. So it's going to go something like this. So from 0 to 1 it's going to go up with a slope of 2 till it reaches the, uh, the peak of 2 and it will be 0 everywhere else. So this is my little r and again this is my sketch of the conditional distribution. Okay so that's how we find conditional distributions. Again a good strategy is to go through uh, the, uh, the conditional I'm sorry, finding conditional density, we go through the conditional distribution. Uh, the, the last piece of this example I want to do is how we, we can find uh, the probability conditioned on a random, a continuous random variable. So for the last part, what we want to do is we're going to find the probability of the event A as a function of little r. So this will still be a little function of little r, but it's going to say, basically it's saying, given that I observed some value of the red spinner, What's the probability that r is bigger than b, and how does that depend on the value of little r? Well, again, from the, the video we did a few minutes ago on the definitions of conditional densities, we also showed that this expression here is the ratio of the conditional density to the overall density uh, times the probability of a. And so we have all the pieces we need just to solve this. We can say the conditional density we just found is 2r. Well, for all the parts where it's, it's interesting, f of r is uniform between 0 and 1, so its density is 1. And then the probability of a we saw was a half. So when all these things clear out, what we end up with is that the probability of a occurring given r is actually bigger the larger r gets. And so that sort of makes sense. If I quickly sketch another version of that square right, where I have R on this side, B on the other. And I'm again interested in you know, my event A is up here in this section. This is, this is the event that R is greater than or equal to B. Right? What, what we've said here is that the the probability, if, if you tell me, you look at it and say, well, I got this value of r here, this value of little r, how probable am I in a? Well, it turns out as, I, as that little r got bigger and bigger, I'm more and more likely to have been in a. Because what I'm saying is I don't know b, but I'm saying I'm, I'm telling you one piece of information. Without knowing b, you say, well, how likely is it that I'm still within this upper triangle? And obviously, geometrically, we can see that increases, right? If I move to another r up here, it's very likely that the value of b still falls in this upper triangle, whereas I'm down here, it's not the case. And so conditional uh, probabilities like that are very important a hypothesis test. We'll, we'll, we'll see that in, in a minute. Uh, so uh, thanks again for your attention. This is, again, an example. Uh, in this example, we saw how we defined conditional densities from conditional distributions by taking a derivative. And then a quick example, on again, on a two-spinner problem, of how we can solve for conditional probabilities of, of uh, discrete events conditioned on continuous random variables. Uh, here's sort of the, the trailing credits. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.